politics essentially is disagreement. Rossier says that so. I mean, everybody agrees that there is a lot of antagonism, agonism, however you call it. <laughs> You know, we are here in Washington, D.C. When they talk about po politics as usual, that's a different terminology. What we, let's say philosophically what we would call politics as usual would be subject positions that are determined and they can stand up through interpolation. As in, show up to vote, you vote, or don't show up to vote because you, your subject position usually doesn't do that, whatever it is. Politics as usual in a philosophical sense would be everybody has a performative role that they have embraced for better or for worse. It may be detrimental to them, it may be politically actually counterproductive for them, but they have accepted it. They are deeply entrenched in it. The insurrectionary movement has to go against all of these sedimented logic. And that's why it's such a rare thing, it's unpredictable. Politics as usual has to change. Insurrection, when I say insurrection, I don't mean in the sense of an armed uprising of some subset of the population against the state. I go back to the 15th century etymological conceptual roots of an insurrection, which means a rising up, risings up from within, risings up that are both within and against, from within and against. I would say any insurrection is a good insurrection because anything that expresses disaffections that are bottled up in a repressive situation of life, in, the, in a repressive conditions of everyday life, where people are so accustomed to just accepting what is unacceptable, what tolerating the intolerable. The psychoanalyst and philosopher, Julia Kristeva, she wrote um, a trilogy of books on revolt from a psychoanalytic perspective in which she understood the, the health of a society that, where the malcontents express themselves vigor, vigorously in the streets. As Kristeva puts it, the worst form of, of sickness and affliction is that which cannot be expressed is that which has no modality of expression, that which is so buried down uh, beneath the, repress the repressive apparatus of oneself and one's life that, 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 that it is uh, doing uh, an enormous amount of damage that can't even be taken up. So I, I think um, that a society that is unhappy, that expresses itself, and more importantly, that expresses itself together, together in joyful moments of human solidarity and interaction. So there's no doubt that we live in an age of riots. Uh, the global restructuring of capital, the global class recomposition, uh, we've already seen this increase in riots, and that's going to keep going, and that's, I think, something we can be sure of. There's almost always a split in what we might call the community of riot. Let's imagine there's a number of people who've participated in a riot, or who feel committed to the riot, or engaged with that experience, that, that moment of sort of potential emancipation and potential fighting back. So if I think about what happened after Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson in the summer of 2014, and that was an extremely sustained uh, ride, an important moment in the trajectory of what we now call Black Lives Matter as a movement. And there was a classic split. On the one side, you have people, and maybe this is stronger at the beginning, who are committed to the riot as a practical activity. Let's say, actually fighting back against cops, destroying state power, actually looting stuff which people often think is like a strange, uh, terrible exception, but the long history of riot is looting from the get-go. It's, it's the most traditional riot activity. 
Uh, so looting, destroying the power of the state, making your neighborhood inhospitable to, to people you don't want to be there, these various practical activities. And then there's the side that gets more committed to a kind of communicative track, uh, who wants to generate support and engagement from people who are probably tuned in via various kinds of media, wants media support, wants a kind of sympathy, engages in a kind of respectability politics, turns toward more uh, kinds of passive resistance and civil disobedience. They often take the Martin Luther King position, who is, has offered one of the famous statements that people often want to use to justify a riot, which is that the riot is the language of the unheard. And of course, this is a lovely sentiment in various ways. Uh, it's not paternalistic, it's not dismissive, it's not, oh, terrible disorder. So one wants to be sympathetic to King's position. Uh, but I also want to be a little bit hesitant or skeptical of it because it does aggressively uh, insist on the riot as a communication, as a kind of language, as needing to be legible, as needing to be heard, as trying to persuade. And I don't think that's the truth of the riot at all. The government isn't able to offer in the way they used to. Historically, in fact, as economies decline, you get greater and greater concentrations of wealth. In general, I don't think the state has the, the deep pockets it once had to buy off the riot. Uh, and as a result, the communicative side, which wants to get bought off, that's always been its goal, uh, is less persuasive. And so that sort of route for social energy or social antagonism to get channeled into after the period of open riot is now a little bit foreclosed and will be increasingly foreclosed over the next 5, 10, 20 years.